please welcome, without further ado, again, Pastor David Brown. Somebody to move this up? Yep. Good morning. Good morning. You tell me in the back if you can hear me. That might be better. I don't know. Whatever you prefer. But uh, I better get all this out of here before I get mixed up. I'm reminded, being very theologically trained as I am, I'm reminded of a movie from the 70s, which of course all of you are too young to remember, but I remember, Smokey and the Bandit, which they sang, we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. <laughs> Amen. That's what we're doing today. I'll, I'll start, though, let's start with a very short word of prayer, and then I'll try to tell you where we're going in the next 45 minutes, hour, whatever time that we have. We pray. Gracious Lord, you have declared in your word that our times are in your hands, and that is your church, your people through any age, even each of us here today. Our pasts are with you this time right now. The president is with you. We are with you and our futures are with you. Even when that day comes that we pass through physical death, we know that we have life in you because of your gift to us of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank and praise you this day as we do, as we did yesterday, as we will do tomorrow. God bless your people now and forever. Amen. I'm going to start off. Where we always start. How are you doing back there? Can you hear me? Good. I'm going to start off with a quick Bible verse. It always seems a good place to start. And this is from the book of Ecclesiastes. King Solomon, we believe, in his later years, Ecclesiastes is a time when he laments many things in life. And one of the things he, he laments are these words. Quote, There is no remembrance of former things, or former people, nor will there be any remembrance of later things or later people yet to be among those who come after. And I say, how true. <laughs> if we think for one moment about how many people have walked on the face of the earth since Adam and Eve, how many do we know? Not just us, but how many does the world remember? Not very many. Even this country, how many people have walked on this, this ground of America since the, since the first? How many of those are remembered? Not very many. The vast, vast majority of people we don't remember. Even if I ask you about your ancestors, how many do you know about? And then some of us will say, well, I've seen a name on a gravestone. Okay, but what about that person? We don't know. And as I was doing some research a couple, three years ago, I came across this on your own website of the Marathon County Historical Society. I found a short little two or three paragraph blurb on our great grandfather. It's called Biography of Charles Brutcher. It's close. Not the Brecher part, right? And it's by a Bill Hart. No offense to Bill Hart. If you know Bill Hart, no offense to Bill Hart if he happens to be here this day. <laughs> he did what he could. But at, at the end of those short three paragraphs, this is what he wrote. Once he, meaning Carl Brecher, left Wausau, his whereabouts and activities are unknown. Well, that's my job. <laughs> extremely briefly, extremely briefly, is to tell you a little bit about the Brecher family and its connection to Wausau. And again, it's covering nearly 80 years, so it's going to have to be brief, 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 as I've mentioned. Hopefully you receive one of these. If you want one, it's very simple. This is what we're following. Very simple. Before Zion and Wausau. During Zion in Wausau, after Zion in Wausau, and I've got two family names that I'm going to track how they got here in roughly five to ten minutes. I'm going to spend 15 minutes or so on what I can tell you about life at Zion and in their personal lives. And I'm going to tell you in five to ten minutes what happened to those families 
that, though, that generation after Wausau. And the hope is that we then have 15, 20 minutes. I don't know, we're starting late. That's always happens at these presentations. We might have to, uh, we might have to fight for the luncheon by getting in there a little late, but we'll figure this out. But hopefully I want some time for your questions, your comments, and your, your thoughts, because I might know more than you about these two families. There are people here who know a whole lot more than me about the history of Zion Lutheran and Wausau. So I'm hoping that I'm going to learn some things while I'm here this morning talking to all of you. Having said that, for time's purposes, I'm going to ask that you hold all your questions or comments until the end. Otherwise, we will never get through some of this. And I know what history does to many of you. Your eyes start glazing over as soon as I start mentioning some dates and some names. I don't know how else to make it exciting except to just plug through and hopefully get to a point where you guys can respond to what I have said. So I will do the best that I can. So we will start. And obviously, my last name is Brecher. So there's a Brecher family that I'm going to bring to Wausau in a very few moments. And what I can tell you is that in 1837, there's no quiz, there's no test coming up. You can just listen to this and have it go in one ear and out the other, just like some of us did in school. <clears throat> but 1837, a 20, let's see, a 24-year-old Brecher came over here and he settled in St. Louis. About two years later, in 1839, if any of you know the history of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, Wather and the Saxons came over in 1839 and settled in St. Louis. On board the ship with Wather was a family of five, including their oldest daughter, Henriette or Henrietta, who was then 13. Three years later, when she was 16, she married this Brecher, Jacob Brecher, who was then 29. That might sound scandalous today. It wasn't back then. Well, women married early in, in their years, and men, you had to have your profession. You had to have a job. You had to have a livelihood or a trade, or your fa future father-in-law would say, uh-uh, you're not marrying my daughter. So this is what happened not only in Jewish communities, uh, Jewish, German communities, but many other, many other of the European uh, communities that were in America. So they will marry. They're going to have eight children. Only three of them reach adulthood. That's very common, as you will know in your ancestors as well. But the youngest living child born in the mid-1850s is Carl Brecher, a name we will talk about more as we go. A couple years after that, his father dies at a young age. So he will be raised in St. Louis with his mother and a stepfather. And basically, I don't know too much about his early life in St. Louis. I do know that the family is very strong Christians and very strong Lutherans. And that much I know because by the 1870s, he's in Fort Wayne, Indiana, studying to be a pastor and then goes to the seminary in St. Louis. So that his first call, 1878, is to eastern Iowa. I don't have any, oh, I can't even see pictures. I'm going to have to move forward a little bit. He goes to, oh, no, I'm not. He goes to, <laughs> he goes to eastern Iowa. It's, it, at that point, it was Buena Vista. It's a little church out in the middle of the country. All that's there today is a cemetery, but you can see where the building was, the parsonage was. It's around Mound City in, in Iowa, if you know any of that. That's still pretty small as well. But nevertheless, he's there doing ministry for four years. However, a year after he got there, he comes back to St. Louis to marry his first wife, Magdalene, who, who was also from the church that he was from, and the families knew each other here in St. Louis. So these two St. Louis kids, born and bred in a city, even back then, where all their family, family are, they go to out in the middle of the country in a small community out in eastern Iowa. That's where they are for four years. They have one child, a stillborn. And I bring that up only because what we know from family history is it's, we're not sure which cause what, but this wife is always referred to as being sickly and weak. 
and are not sure whether the sickly and weak uh, woman caused the stillborn or whether the stillborn caused her to be sick and weakly in her later life. That I don't know. But anyway, she is just going to be described by other members of the family after that as being sickly and weak. So that happens, and then they adopt a little girl because of that. And at the end of 82, 82 to 89 now, they, he takes a call to western Iowa, which is around today Ricketts, Iowa. He's going to serve St. Paul's there and a preaching station, station in Charter Oak. Now, it's very interesting to me, and I don't have the answers for you, is that these two kids who grew up in St. Louis whose all their family is in St. Louis. And just like today, when pastors get an opportunity, where do they usually go? They're going to migrate back to their home, or at least to a city, a metropolis, to be closer to family or get closer to a life that they experience and they know. Not in this case. He goes from a small community out in the, out in the country in eastern Iowa to way out in western Iowa. Western Iowa in 1870s, 1880s, was the edge of the frontier. This is wild land going on out there. But nevertheless, this is where they go. Why and all the rationale, I could not tell you. But there they are. They will spend seven years out there. They will have a second child who dies in six weeks. So once again, there's something with this wife being sickly and ill that causes these deaths. They have a third child who lives. And all I know is that by 18... 89, the pastor at the, we're now at the 5th and Scott Church down the street. That pastor leaves and they call two other pastors. They decline. And what I know is that they then called Pastor Brecher to come from Western Iowa to be the pastor here at Zion. Now, what's interesting to me is you may not, may not know this. Keen sitting here in the third row has been a help to me very much. But he has revealed to me that there are English translations of the German original voters meetings here. And they have been a, a tremendous uh, help in all of this. And they were very good at qu their quarterly meetings. But during the call process, or what they called it back then, they had a lot of other meetings in between where they were call deciding on who to call as pastor. Certainly they took minutes, but we don't know where they are. So how they got a hold of a name, Pastor Brecher, who's out in western Iowa, who has no connection to Wisconsin that I know of, or a connection to Wausau, how they got here and called him to be a pastor, I don't know. But he will show up in the fall of 1889 with two children and his wife. The parsonage still at that time is, let's see, I don't know what direction I'm facing, but is still down at, at Plummer and... Help me. Plummer and Seymour. And so that, that was being renovated at that time. And so this man called Adolf Veachman, it's, a, it sounds, it's pronounced with a V, but in, in English it's a W. Adolf Veachman, who is a member of the congregation, graciously offers to house the Brecher family in his home with his family for the two or three or four months until the parsonage is renovated. And that will include, hint, 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 where we're going, a 20-year-old, their oldest child, who is still living, single and never been married, Emma. I'm going to jump over now to then the, Wheat, the Veachman side. How, who were they and where did they come from? Real quick. Adolf Veachman, who's going to be the head of this family, comes over in the mid-1850s, 23-year-old. He comes over and within eight months, he's up in the Alguma area now, which is, for those of you who don't know, east of Green Bay, right on Lake Michigan. Beautiful country. Been there. It's wonderful. He's already buying property. Now, many people who came over here to the United States, they didn't have money to buy property within eight months at age 20, what did I just say, 23. That tells me that he, his family and he had money in the old country that he brought over that he was able to buy property right away. A year later, another family, the Damas family, comes over and they're doing the same thing. Included there is a 14-year-old girl. Is this starting to sound like before? Johanna. So what happens? 
1860, 27-year-old Adolf and 17-year-old Johanna Mary. And again, it's after Adolf can prove that he has a livelihood, a trade, and money to take care of his wife and family. They will have 12 children. Only six will live to be adults. He's a farmer then, but once again, both of these families are strong Christians and strong Lutherans. Both Adolf and this Frederick Damas, they are original signers of the Constitution of the St. Paul's Lutheran Church. It's still there today. That's in Alguma. And Adolf will be the secretary. There are still many records of his handwritten German script in there from the 1860s. The fact that he's chosen to be secretary and you can see his beautiful penmanship and writing skills. Not only did he come over to this country with money, he came over here with an education. And you're going to see these, well, we're going to see these traits as we move forward, what kind of man we get some hints about. So very active, both families in the church there in what is today Alguma. They are both farmers. And during that time there in 1863, their first child dies, their second child lives, and that is Emma. He does farming for 14 years. I don't think he ever had his heart in it, but he farms for 14 years. And then in the 70s, he ups and moves his family then, family of four, not just to the nearest metropolis, but he goes from Alguma, which is almost as far east as you can go in Wisconsin, all the way over to La Crosse, right on the Mississippi River. Why? I don't know. I'm assuming, I might guess, it's, it's for business opportunities, because when he gets over there, he's going to be listed over there as a carpenter. So whether he brought those skills over, where he, whether he learned those as a farmer, I do not know. But I'm guessing, and it's purely guess, that he moved the family for an opportunity of a booming town on the Mississippi to make better money for himself and his family as a carpenter. They become very active in the church there, which is First Lutheran downtown. It's still there, has a lot of records that I've plowed through. And yet something happens because within three years, what he hoped was going to be a life in La Crosse must not have been. Because now he buys a farm about an hour northeast and they start farming again. Why he left? I don't know. Could have been the life of a river town on the Mississippi. Not always the best place to raise a family during these years. But I do not have any idea. And then a couple years later, while they're on the farm up there, three of his surviving six children at this time die in a diphtheria epidemic. Again, common in these days. For whatever reason, they uproot again, and they come to Wausau in the fall of 1879, about 10 years before the Bretchers get here. They join the church. They're very active in the church. He is now listed as a carpenter, builder, and contractor. I have found sources that he or his business built many of the old homes and old businesses in the old part of town, which could extend some some houses up. I don't know where I'm pointing anymore. (laughs) Over there, I guess. Houses over there could be. And I do know that he made money at building. He made money and he, he put it into his children's future businesses and made money. And he made money at buying and selling property. And so every time after this, when Zion Lutheran is either looking for property to buy or is building something or renovating something, Adolf Veachman is on the committee every time. That's going to be his expertise, and they're going to lean on him heavily for that. So they're, right away, they need some property. They want to build a parsonage. He, he helps find the property that is the parsonage on Plummer and Seymour. And that is the first picture I'm going to show whoever's doing that. This is the corner of Seymour and Plummer. This house is in the corner. This would have been the site of Zion's original church. This building here would have been not only the site of the parsonage, and you can still, it's, this is what it looks like today. You can go down there and see it. But um, Gary, wherever Gary is, 
who works, who's down at the Historical Society, we're still investigating this building because this not only is the site of the parsonage down there, but given that it looks nothing like the other houses on the street, this actually may be, and we're still investigating, the original skeleton of the original parsonage of Zion that's just been remodeled over the years. Because if it would have come down for some reason and they would have built a house there any time in the last 150 years, 25 years, it wouldn't look more like that than this kind of barracks looking little building. We don't know that for sure, but it's a, very, a good possibility. So that's where they are going to live when, or that's when they build that parsonage. Uh, picture number two. Any of you, any of you been down to Ebert's and, and Gerbert's sandwich place? A couple of years after the Adolf Veachman family get here, he buys this place. This will become their storefront. Various businesses we'll get into. Originally, his building contracting business. And they're going to live up here on the second floor in the flat. And this, this site has the look and feel and footprint of the building that was there then. But our guess is that probably this was a wooden building back then. And somebody, it could have been Adolf, had that tore down and built a similar one on the same site made out of the brick and stone. But we're not, I'm not sure of that either. But this is where Adolf Veachman and family lived on 4th and Jefferson. And you guys know where these places are. You, you've seen them. And again, first, first of all, when they come, this is his building business. But by the middle 18, early 1880s, now his oldest living daughter, this Emma, she has a business here. She is a milliner, which I did not know what it was. I had to look it up. It shows you what I know. But it's, a, it's somebody who makes woman's clothing and sells woman's clothing and goods. So that was the business going on in here. So Adolf provided the money, and the business was his daughter's. And later, the next daughter, Clara, she's going to be in here doing hairdressing and women's hair products. That's going to be going on here at 4th and Jefferson while the family lives on the top floor. Uh, in, in the mid-1880s, you know this, Zion went looking for a site so they could build a bigger church. Guess who's on the committee? Adolf Veachman, and they find the two lots next to, or excuse me, that are going to be the, the, the Fifth and Scott Church today. I got two pictures of that, please. I did not take this. It's, a, it's from one of your uh, anniversary booklets. But as best as you can tell, that is the Fifth and Scott Zion Church that's on the corner of Fifth and Scott. Next one, please. You may not recognize that one, but you recognize this one. That's where the site is. So it was right here, facing west. That's Zion number two, where my kin all went to church for many, 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 many years. So that's what it looks like today. Uh, they, 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 they renovate. The parsonage, again, as I told you, and Pastor Brecher shows up in 89, and they stay with the Veachmans in the second floor of that flat on the storefront that we just saw. And in there, that's where Pastor Brecher meets 26-year-old Emma. No scandal, just letting you know, just letting her know that that's happening. Let's see here. So that brings us, that's how they got here. Now I'm going to change, I've been kind of going chronologically up to this point, at this point for this section, I'm going to go kind of topically of what was their life here at Zion and Wausau and what was going on at Zion during these years. And I have to do this as brief as I can. Next picture, however, please. This is Carl, Pastor Carl Brecher. This is probably him at the end of those 21 years. So there's the best picture I could find. So he's, he's younger when he gets here, which we will see. But that's Carl Brecher. I don't know. I don't think I look anything like him, maybe except for the gray. That's about all I can tell. But 
for Zion during this time, from the 1890s to the 19 teens, basically. First, I want to talk about you, everybody know it's a time of high growth. The church was bursting at the seams pretty much all the time. I would give, the, of course, the glory to God. I would give some thanks and praise to Zion and Pastor Brecher. But as you probably know, in that, that time was a peak of immigration from Europe and, and Germany and German Lutherans. So they were coming over here by the you-know-what, and therefore settling in German Lutheran communities, including Wausau. So it just meant more and more and more and more and more people. And so I, I've, I've found that Pastor Brecher and Zion were constantly helping other communities in the area and their German Lutherans in helping with starting a church and preaching station and the like. So they did that to St. John's in Mosinee. Am I pronouncing that right? And for those of you who don't know, I think that's about 20 miles south. Is that what I got? So he helped down there. And 20 miles when you're riding on a horse. You know, you don't do that like we do today. Uh, he was also helped serve a new church in Easton, which is about 18 miles east. Is that about right? Okay. Easton. Imagine that being east. I don't know. Uh, also helping the church in Rib Hill. That's west. Or... West. And, and you know that in the early 1900s, a good number of members, families from this congregation purposely split with Zion's okay to start Trinity, <laughs> Trinity across the river, which is still there. I just passed it this morning. So this shows you that there's growing going on, and Pastor Brecher and Zion are very eager to help other communities here in the immediate area. But with growth comes what? Growing pains. And this is going on constantly, that there's never enough of anything to cover all the influx of people, and especially the buildings. No matter what building they were in, it never lasted very long before it had to be renovated, and finally... Uh, a new one built. And so in 19, 1890, yes, Adolf Veachman is on the committee to look for lots. He buys one, two lots by himself. This shows you that he had some money in this German community. He buys two lots across the street from the Fifth and Scott Church. He then offers them at cost to Zion because they would make a great site to do something for the church. So they take him up on that offer he, offer, he sells them, and these are pictures, the next couple pictures. Let's see, I can't even remember what I got here. Oh. Um, no, let's try the next one. And we, can we go back later, I hope? Those lots will become the, the new then parsonage and the school that were across the street from the Zion at Fifth and Scott. This is the parsonage. This is a picture of the parsonage after it was moved. Don't ask me how they did this. This is what I found. They moved that whole thing across the street next to the church in the 30s, 1930s. That's what I have read. Not getting a nod, yes. I don't know. How they, I don't even want to know how they did that. But they did it. So that's a picture in the, of the 1930s, but that's the parsonage that was across the street originally. Let's see here. And then, of course, and you know that in the 1902 and 03, the church at Fifth and Scott was heavily renovated and enlarged. So this is what you do when you've got a lot of people coming in. And a lot of people coming over from Germany were young couples, middle-aged couples, and what do they have? Children. And so they've just got, they're booming. And when they renovated in 1902 and 03, guess who was on the committee? Quids. Yeah, Adolf was on that one as well. Um, yeah, not, okay. One of the things that came up in, in the early 1900s, and this is going to have uh, re relevance later, is that I found in the church minutes that they now were going to teach confirmation also in English. And parents could choose. We think, well, of course. That was a huge deal at that time for Zion and for every other German Lutheran church in anywhere in this, on this continent. But it's going to have ramifications in the future, which we'll talk about. 
obviously when you have an influx of people, you're going to have some issues. And one of the things I noticed, and you already know this, one of the major, well, I, don't, I wouldn't call it a major issue, but a reoccurring issue that came up. Uh, Carl Brecher wasn't here a month, and he had to give a presentation to the voters about secret lodges. Because that's going on. It was going on before he got here. It's going to go on. It was going on in many other churches at the time. I found that in 1900, there were 27 secret societies in Wausau. It was just going on. And in his presentation, he affirmed from Scripture that because of their secretness and because they had rituals and confessions and words that were anti-Bible, that it was, not, it was not right for a Christian to belong to the Christian church and to the secret societies at the same time. There weren't a, really a lot of major issues about that. It's just that it kept coming up about every two or three or four years, it seemed like. In terms of Carl Brecher, at this time during this ministry, he's very busy because there's just people pouring in all the time. He's helping with all these other churches. He's heavily involved in synod and district. He, I t he is a president of an orphanage. I found out he's the director, one of the directors at the Lutheran Hospital. So what I see is he's just busy. I can't imagine all that he had to do and was doing when you're riding around in a wagon or a... Uh, uh, or on a horse and buggy or whatnot. In the, 1890, in the 1890s, Adolf Veachman buys a hardware store, and it is for himself and his son, his oldest living son, Louis. It's just, it's where they're building that parking lot. I don't remember on that, down there by 4th and Jefferson, where all the construction is. He bought a hardware store there, and his son had been working in a hardware store, and that will become their business, and both the son and he will make lots of money at the hardware store. He is, not, he is not one of the major wealthy peoples in town in the English community, which would be mostly from the builders and those who are cutting down logs and whatnot, but I know without any real proof that in this Zion German Lutheran community, he will be one with one of a few that has the most money because of what of their biz, his business sense, his education, and, and, and what he was doing with his, his children. Anyway, Carl Brecher gets here with his sickly wife, remember that? And she, after only being here for seven months, finally passes away. She's buried in Pine Grove Cemetery down south of town. So he is now there here, Pastor Brecher with two children, one who's adopted, a five-year-old and a ten-year-old. And what do you think he's going to have on his mind? <laughs> Getting married. And so it happens that a year later, this is back to picture six, if you can get there. He's going to marry. Then he's 36. He's going to marry 28-year-old, never been married, and, and single, Emma Veachman. That, he, that is this, the wife or the daughter of Adolf. So you can see he looks a little bit younger than that first picture. But I don't know if this is their wedding picture, but I think it is. It looks like it. And, and the Brechers today, this line is more what we look like. So the, the, the wife's features, tracing a spring back to her parents and grandparents, is more what I look like than him. For better or for worse. Yeah, right, yeah, I'll just leave it like, I think she's looking pretty nice right there, if you ask me. Am I biased? Probably. They're going to have four children of their own and adopt another. And then after that joy, the tragedy is, is that his son, Carl Brecher's son, the last one that was born in Iowa, six-year-old son dies. I don't know what or why. He's also buried at the Pine Grove Cemetery. Um, in the, the parsonage is built. We saw that in, in 19, or 1893. That fall, the first child to be born at the parsonage is going to be his second son from Emma, Paul Brecher, which is our grandfather. Going to be born in the parsonage. In the, the picture number nine in the late 90s, uh, 
Oh, I saw, I didn't show you this one. <laughs> this is the parsonage site today. It looks really nice, doesn't it? <laughs> there's the bank. And there's the corner where the school was and the parsonage. So my grandfather was born right here. That's really, com it's really commemorated very well. Isn't it? <laughs> Next picture. So this is now about 1900. This is Emma Carl. This is adopted, adopted. This is grandpa, my grandpa, and our grandpa, Paul. I don't know exactly when this, I'm, I'm going to guess this is about 1900. That's what it, it is to me. So that's the family that's growing at this point. And behind Ebert and whatever, the sandwich spot, if you've been there, there's that stone house. You see it right behind there? Adolf Weichmann bought that property and built a really nice home on there that they lived their final years. I don't think that's it, but I think it probably looks pretty close to what they would have bought in that German style stone and everything. But we haven't been able to track all that down. What is it? It's pretty dental. I don't know what I did with the picture, but I did see it. So you sent it to me. So I must have missed it when I was going to drive by this afternoon and check it out. In, in, in that picture of the family picture, the second adopted daughter, uh, Pastor Brecher is, in, is helping with the orphanage, the president, and the orphanage cr closes because they ran out of money. And I'm sure like other families, what they do? They took one into their home and raised her as their own. Then we get the, the tragedy that in the early 1904, Emma, 40 years old, within two weeks gets sick and dies. She has severe headaches and fits. It could be an aneurysm that they didn't know what it was back then. But she's going to leave now. They're going to have, leave him with six children from a three-year-old up to the 20-year-old. And what do you think a pastor's going to do? What's he going to do with a three-year-old when he's running around all these communities trying to spread the gospel? So that in two years, he's going to marry his third wife, another Emma. It's a pastor's daughter that's never been married from Milwaukee. And yet in 16 months, guess what? She dies. <coughs> Don't know. So what happens is that now we're at 1911, January 1911, he requests from Zion his resignation as pastor of Zion. To the voters, it's called, he, he, he reports that it is his health, and they don't go into any details, but the, the church agreed with whatever he said and gave him a peaceful release and resignation. To his son, our grandfather, he gave some other reasons, but I think they, not other, but maybe more detailed reasons that certainly attributed to his health. One, I find out this is where the English comes in, is that Zion requested from him that he start preaching also in English. And his response to his son was, I can speak English. I can read English. If you give me a prayer or a book in English, I can do it. But to write a sermon in English and create a sermon my own in English, I don't think in my mid-50s I'm going to be able to do that. And I'm sure that caused him some stress and anguish about what to do with that situation. Also, his oldest son, which I haven't mentioned, was born with what we would today, well, no, what they would call back then even something worse, severely handicapped, although he overcame it and had a brilliant career later on. But at this time, he's in his late teens, and Carl Brecher said, I got to establish some kind of business for him before Social Security, before welfare, so that he has some income coming in. I've got to do something for this son. And then lastly, which is really disheartening for me, is he reports to his son that he has an open clash with the Veachman family. And it's not Adolf and his wife, because they're in their 70s and 80s. It's their oldest surviving son, Louis, who is the head of the hardware store. And I've learned from a few sources that he had an issue of him marrying another Emma besides his sister 
two years after his sister died. I don't know what he was supposed to do, but he basically, he, he kept up a relationship with his nieces and nephews, but he had no relationship with Carl Brecher that I know of after that. And so one of the things, and of course they're both members of the congregation, and Lewis is going to be a very, very prominent active member of the congregation. It was causing problems in the church, or at least the separation. And so he has that, these two families that I show are now going to be divided for the most part. And I think it's going to affect him in many ways. One is just the fact that you're divided. But I think as long as he was married to Emma, they enjoyed nice things in their life because of the Veachman money. When she died, that stopped. And now all of a sudden, he's having to make other decisions in life for his children that he would not have had to had she survived. So he resigns. He says, I'll stay, I'll stay on it through confirmation in the summer. I'll stay on until your next pastor comes. He preaches his last his sermon as Zion's pastor in spring of, of uh, 1911, which gets us through that part. And quickly, I'm going to tell you what happened, which Bill Hart, if you're down, if you're listening, you can write these things down and add to your three paragraphs that are online about what happened to Pastor Brecher when he left. And here's what I can tell you real briefly. He moves, Carl Brecher moves with his mostly adult children at this time to Shano. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That way. <laughs> and he helps with the church there for a year or so. And he also establishes a bookstore that his oldest son, the one that would be called back then severely handicapped, is running. And the only reason I mention that is because in the next five years sometime, Paul Brecher, who is studying to be a pastor during vacations or in the summer, he's going to go to that bookstore, and guess what? He meets this young woman from Shano, and they get married, and that is our grandmother, Minnie. <laughs> so that's, that they met at this bookstore in Shano. So that's how that happens. And I told you he returns that fall to preach at Zion's 37th anniversary, in that same year, Adolf Veachman dies at 81. He's also buried at the Pine Grove Cemetery. And the next year, Carl Brecher marries his fourth wife. Another single, never been married pastor's daughter at 42. And she, from what we know in family history, she didn't really want to have anything to do with any of the kids. And so basically... <laughs> They're going to be adults and pretty much on their own for the most part, except showing up once in a while to see how dad's doing. He takes a call to what is today Cincinnati, White Oak, Ohio, for three years. Then from 1914 to 23, he comes back and he is pa pastor at St. Peter's in Lebanon. That's about a half hour west of Milwaukee. And that's close to her kin. I'm guessing that's where that came from, is let, let's get closer to my kin and us back in Wisconsin. And I have two pictures. Oh, yeah, I have these two pictures. Why do I have pictures of St. Peter's Lutheran Church in Lebanon when I'm in Wausau, Wisconsin? Well, that's because you can see they added, they've added on through the years, but this stone sanctuary is their original church building. And as I was there, I found out that Carl Brecher, this is the sanctuary that he served in for nine years. The next photo, until this morning, this was the first experience I've ever had. This is the original altar and pulpit of that church, which meant my great-grandfather served at this altar and preached at this pulpit. Guess what I did? I didn't preach, but I got up there and I put my hands on these rails and I said, you know, I don't think I've ever touched anything that my great grandfather has ever touched. But I said, guess what? I've mixed my DNA with his. <laughs> so in future years, they could say, hey, well, there's, there's two generations here. Yeah, you betcha, because I touched that. Until this morning when I found out that that uh, wine dispenser, what's that called, flagon upstairs, one of those was used by Carl Brecher, and of course after service I went there and I touched him. <laughs> Call me weird, but I felt a connection there that I did not have beforehand. 
In 23, he will then retire. They will move to Milwaukee. They will buy a house. Then what happens in 29? The Depression. And so then they will be in an apartment. He will come back in 24 to preach at the 50th anniversary in 1924. Uh, in, 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 in 24, Johanna Wieckman, the mother, will also die, be buried at Pine Grove. And we'll show you this picture. I've been saying Pine Grove a lot. We're going to go there as family here in a little bit. This is the Veachman family plot. And they're over here. And a couple of his sons and grandsons and whatnot. I don't going to say anything, but you can, this monument in the middle that just has the Veachman name, it's one of the bigger ones out there. <laughs> which, just, which just again shows you the money that was in that family in his, fam in his name and in his son Lewis's name. I won't tell you, but I have seen his will in the eight, 1930s, during the Depression, what he left for his family. And most of us would be very happy with that today, how much money this family had generated over the years. So they did very, very well. And the Brecher family got nothing of that. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I wouldn't be standing here. Maybe I would be in... Uh, some island in the Caribbean, I don't know, possibly. It's very, hard, it's, it's very hard to find out anything about your ancestors this far back. It's very hard to find out about the wives. It's extremely hard. But when Johanna died, in her obituary, it said this, that I was very happy to read. She was a devoted member of Zion Lutheran Church and a charter member of the Ladies Aid Society. And she was its first president holding office for 25 years. Her picture in, in her later life is one, in, in one of your uh, anniversary booklets. I did not put it here because I didn't have a picture of Adolf. But nevertheless, it shows you that she was just as active here at the last church as Adolf was. He comes back in 34 and preaches again at the 50th anniversary of the 5th and Scott Church. My, our grandfather, Paul, preached in the English service, as I, as I said before. Carl Brecher will die in January of 38 in Milwaukee. He's buried there with his fourth wife. But he will, it's interesting, Keen and I found there was in the minutes of the ladies' aid from Zion that pastor came in and requested of the ladies' aid if they could contribute anything in 1938 to Pastor Brecher's funeral and cemetery costs because it was reported that he was very poor and they didn't even have the money to bury him. And if that went to the ladies' aid, I'm sure it went to the people of Zion as well. This shows you what happened during Depression to many, but I'll show you what happened to any, any retirement dreams he had because of the Depression and the fact that he was ostracized from the Veachman money. I found this in the Lutheran Witness of that year. Simply it says, quote, Reverend Brecher was a tireless worker in the kingdom, an effective preacher, a faithful shepherd, a champion of Christian education, and a fearless Christian personality. Deeply involved in the affairs of Synod, he followed its programs with fine understanding and appreciation to the very last. In summary then, here's what I would say. He spent pretty much almost half of his ministry here, well not here, but Zion in Wausau, and it was his most productive ministry. Uh, before that, most of the places he were at were small country places, but this was bigger, a bigger community, and a bulging times time for Lutheran church. 